As you know, uh, one of the commitments for EFAT 11 is that we are going to be mainstreaming youth into our portfolio. So one of the questions that we have to ask ourselves is how are we going to do that? What's the best way to do that? We know that uh, youth are two or three times more likely to be unemployed. They tend to have less of a voice in government. Uh, and there's a whole set of constraints that they face that are, are different from the, the general population. So a lot of what we want to talk about today is uh, the challenges that youth face uh, in rural areas. And to do that, we have a, a nice panel that we've put together, um, starting uh, on your left and moving to the right. We have Dominic Ziller, the Director General for International Development Policy with the Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, BMZ, uh, in Germany. The ministry, of course, works to encourage economic development within Germany and in other countries through international cooperation and partnerships. And of course, I'm sure you know, the G20, which German presidency was on, uh, played a big role in pushing for, for youth in the agenda. Then next to Dominic, we have Rita Kimani, the chief executive officer for FarmDrive in Kenya. FarmDrive uses mobile phones, alternative data, and machine learning to close the critical data gap that prevents financial institutions from lending to creditworthy smallholder farmers. And then next to her, we have Mei Tin Yuman. Uh, Yuman is a global, is the representative for Global Indigenous Youth Caucus. Uh, she's Indigenous Youth Leader from the Chin Human Rights Organization in Myanmar and also represents Asia Indigenous Youth to the Executive Council of Asia Indigenous Peoples Pact. And next to her, we have Sebastian uh, Pedraza, the representative from the National Rural Youth Network in Colombia. The National Rural Youth Network in Colombia is working with the Colombian Rural Dialogue Group, seeking advocacy and policy through dialogue for the construction of public policy guidelines for rural youth in Colombia. And then last at the end, we have Victor Rosca. He is the director of EFAD's Consolidated Program Implementation Unit in Moldova. Um, this unit was created by the government to, e to implement uh, EFAD programs in the country. And they have a long history of doing youth type programs and, and, and he'll be bringing that experience to the discussion. Uh, to start with, um, as uh, noted, one of the, the questions, one of the things that we're planning to do at EFAD is to invest in rural youth, but it raised the question of, you know, why should we? Why should we invest in rural youth? And so we're going to have all the panelists answer that one question, first starting with, with Rita. So why, why invest in rural youth? Thank you. Um... I mean, in the first place, um, if you're not yet convinced that we should be investing in the rural youth, then um, I hope by the end of this panel, you'll be rallying your government to do more of that. Um, but one thing I like about this question and even how IFAD frames um, uh, investing in youth, it's because uh, it's being looked at as an investment, something that will have a huge return. Uh, and not just one of the many humanitarian things that need to be done just because. So um, the fact that this is being viewed as an investment um, to invest in rural youth, then um, the trickle effects in terms of uh, the kind of impact it can have uh, is all the way from just food security to uh, when you think about the troubles or some of the challenges posed by urbanization and a lot of youths migrating to the uh, urban centers, then uh, it really is uh, uh, quite intuitive that we should be investing in this rural youth to prevent a lot of uh, troubles or uh, challenges that uh, follow through after some of these youths are in, unemployed are, and are moving to uh, the urban areas. Um, we've spoken a lot about fragility and uh, from my perspective, one of the, um, uh, especially ca coming from Africa where the youth population is really, really rapidly growing and it will continue to grow and yet most of them are um, unemployed. This is really uh, one of the areas and one of the things that um, if we do not take the opportunity to invest in the youths, then uh, we are creating room for uh, more fragile uh, situations or states um, um, and hence why we should really invest in the rural youth. Um, yeah. That's it. And, and most importantly to add is that um, uh, I like to say that um, 
not investing in the youth has gotten us where we are today, but we really need a lot of, um, the youth come with a lot of energy, a lot of innovation uh, that is really going to help so solve some of the bigger challenges um, uh, currently facing the world. So we really have no any other choice aside from investing in the youth and the rural youth specifically. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. So to, the concern about fragility, but also the potential for innovation. So next we'll move to Sebastian. Um, why invest in rural youth? And uh, Sebastian will be speaking in Spanish. So if you don't speak Spanish, please go ahead and put your, uh, your translator on. So. Just in, in first place, I want to say thank you to the IFAT, the president and all his staff for giving the opportunity to be here uh, being the rural youth boys. Um, I'm going to speak in Spanish, how Paul said. Um, yes, okay. I think that rural youth, well, we're the present and the future. We are those who will provide the generational bridge. We'll bridge the generational gap. We will not take people out of the field. We won't take adults out of the field because we need their experience so that we too can learn and we need their know-how. So we are the generation who will guarantee that production continues so that the countryside can be transformed. That is why it's extremely important to invest in rural youth. We are the ones with the ideas, with the strength, and along with our ancestors in the fields, know-how and knowledge, we will be able to develop the countryside and farms. An argument that uh, the youth is the future uh, and, and we need to invest to make sure that we invest in the future. Okay, next we'll have uh, Yuman. Why, why should we invest in rural youth? Um, uh, yes, uh, most of it has been covered. And uh, yes, uh, when uh, we look at uh, the world's population, uh, youth comprise, uh, comprise a very big percentage. And among that, uh, even uh, youth population, it's 70% of the youths are in rural areas. So we are really big and uh, we are a very big force if we really want uh, the sustainable development and if we uh, really want to uh, achieve uh, these goals. Um, so that we are a really big force. And as a person who comes from an indigenous uh, the people's community, uh, we also have a different uh, uh, con uh, ways of contribution that, uh, that uh, we can make. Uh, we have these solutions, uh, which are like traditional knowledge. We are the ones to maintain this traditional knowledge, which can bring solution to the existing uh, problems within societies. So it is uh, really important to invest in the rural youths. Yeah. Right. Another good point that, uh, that ultimately, if we want to achieve the objectives that we're after, we need to have youth to do it. So it's an important component of it. Uh, next, we'll move to Dominic. Uh, so why, why invest? Well, I think that it's extremely important for you to invest uh, in young people, especially in rural areas. Um, because we, as, as an aging society, uh, I could say not just in Germany, even in the whole of Europe, um, we've probably lost a bit the feeling for what it's like to have such a young, dynamic, vibrant society as most of IFAD's partner countries do have. And if, if you lose these people when they're young, it will be much more difficult to bring them back into the economy, into employment, um, into the national uh, economy later. Uh, plus, if, if, if young people lose touch with their society, um, if they are outcasts, they are more prone to criminality, they are more prone to drug abuse and, and whatever else you might imagine. So if we tackle youth employment, especially in the rural areas, we can deal with two of the main causes of um, underdevelopment. Uh, first, we give perspectives to people, we bring them out of poverty. And secondly, um, in the rural areas, that's where food is produced. So we also tackle hunger. And I think that's why it's so important for IFAD, especially IFAD, um, to go into not just these areas, but to also have a specific um, uh, eye on these young people <coughs> to continuously 
develop um, its, its approach on how to better integrate, especially young people. I'm so happy that for once I bring down the average age uh, <laughs> on such a panel, because even at 50, normally I, I still bring it down, and now I finally bring it up. Yeah? And it's so great not to just talk about young people, but with young people, and, and I liked your contributions very much. Thank you very much. Another argument that if we want to achieve our goals, then we really have to invest in the youth. Uh, Victor, why should we invest in youth? Why should we invest? That's because these are probably the most active, enthusiastic, dynamic, and very promising part of the society. Uh, young people represent probably one quarter of the population, but we need to recognize that their role in the political, economical life it's disproportionately lower, and we need to invest in that. Absence of uh, opportunities to support youth initiatives, I would say, has a destructive effect because it's turning young people from their active, active life in the society to a kind of passive recipient of the eye, which is not correct, and that's why we need to support them. In any case, if they will not have a support, they later they will leave the community or the country they will leave. And in general, my say is if a country is not investing in youth generation, it is at the risk that it will lose the most active part of the society and in the future will face with very serious demographic and economical problem. That is why we need to invest in. Right. So we, we all seem to agree that we need to invest in youth, that uh, there, you have the potential for, for growth, for reaching the sustainable development goals. And if you don't, you have the risk of the downside fragility. Um, so I'll go back to, to Rita and ask uh, another question. So we, know we, we, we all agree we should invest, but what is needed to create the opportunities for our youth? And why would you make an argument that agriculture might be, in particular, a way to go forward? Um, I'll, I'll start by responding to why agriculture. I think um, when we look at the rural communities, then agriculture is what they depend on for a, for a living, um, albeit uh, for now it being uh, really most of them living below poverty lines, but that's really what they depend on for a living. So you cannot talk about um, transformation um, in, or um, investing in the rural youth and not talk about agriculture. So uh, um, even the work that we do, uh, I'm really, really passionate about um, um, making agriculture work for uh, the rural communities and especially the youth. And one of the uh, main things we push for is um, that we need to start viewing agriculture as a business. Mm -hmm. Um, and in that sense, we need the, fa the st first step to actually create these opportunities is to look at these youths, look at us as um, youths who are really passionate and really want to go out there and be entrepreneurs, build businesses that actually work. So for me, that's really an important component. How do we change our views from looking at youths as just um, a, a group that depends on the much older generation, but rather a group that is really willing, ready, and has the time and energy to go out and build new things, create businesses. Um, so from number one, the perspective of changing our views and also instilling that in the youth themselves that um, they need to start viewing themselves as very capable of um, achieving some of the big audacious dreams that they have. So for me, that's usually one of the key um, things. How do we just change that perspective? How do we instill that different perspective in the youths? Um, can you, sorry, can I interrupt? Uh, yeah. Can you give examples of how you might do that? I mean, you know, a young person in rural Kenya and they think, well, I want to go to Nairobi. Why do I want to stay here? Why do I want to do this backbreaking work in agriculture? So how do you go about convincing them? What types of actions are you guys taking to, to, to make it appealing? Um, I'll just speak on what you've said, that why, um, why remain in the rural areas and farm and put in a lot of hard work um, doing the manual work. But one of the th other major things when we think about agriculture in the rural areas is to expand our view about the opportunities that are available. The opportunities are not just the on-farm activities. 
agriculture is a val very long value chain that um, we can en engage the youth all the way from the on-farm production uh, activities to engaging them in helping to uh, um, um, uh, give extension services. Uh, for agriculture, there's someone who needs to sell the inputs, the farm inputs to the farmers. Those are opportunities for the youths to be engaged in that to uh, marketing of those products to one of the things that um, uh, is being pushed a lot, um, especially in African countries, is uh, processing uh, whatever we produce on the farm so that we can uh, add some value to it. So I think number one is to also expand that view of what, um, uh, what are those opportunities. It's not just uh, on the farm uh, activities. And the thing is for the youth to be able to do all this, um, one key thing that they need is actually access to finance. Um, for them to set up uh, businesses, for them to use some of these technologies on the farms that will get them interested because honestly, even myself, I wouldn't want to spend weeks with, um, uh, we call it a djembe, a manual tool uh, digging the, the farm. Like no youth would want to do that. We mm. want to automate things, but all these new technologies require uh, finances to be able to afford. So um, that's again why even as uh, farm drivers and organization, we really are keen or uh, if we want um, the youth and farmers to look at agriculture, not just as something that they're doing because their forefathers did it, because anyway you were born and there's a farm uh, and people need to eat, but really can you earn a living and not just any living, a decent living out of it, then asking ourselves what is needed, what are those resources, how can we make them accessible to the youth? Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, building on that, so Rita's talked about some opportunities. Um, what about challenges? Uh, so Sebastian, what are the main challenges for you and rural youth to overcome, particularly in countries like Colombia, which are in a transition, uh, had the conflict, but is dealing with that now? So what are the challenges you think there are uh, to move forward? Okay. Well, I don't think everyone is aware of the situation that Colombia is facing after a 50-year conflict. Rural areas were the main hubs where the conflict took place. As a consequence, many families and young people had to leave the places where they lived and move to cities. Those who stayed in cities and those young people we've been working with in Colombia, many of them are still very much affected psychologically due to the conflict that they saw firsthand in the rural areas. It's very important for us to begin to organize youth, however, because this is one way for all the investment that comes in to be sustainable. If we invest in a young person, so long as that young person keeps working for the organization, we can achieve sustainability. Of course, after the conflict period, it became difficult to invest in and in access rural areas. In Colombia, there is a real lack of infrastructure and opportunities such as education and employment in the countryside. But investment is starting up again, making farms more active, making farms sexy for rural youth so that they go back to the area. So it's extremely important for young people to understand and really feel that they own the countryside. We have done this through training in our rural youth network. If we begin to train young people so that they feel attached to their land, no matter what happens, they will stay in the rural area. We've also seen young people who have an opportunity to go to school through the network. They go to the city for their studies and then go back to rural areas and invest at the local level. So it's of the utmost importance. I think the main challenge is to begin to generate capacity in the field, in farms, so that young people, who are the key players, themselves begin to generate that development. So it's important that we generate that leadership and enhance that leadership so that there is really a true network with other organizations. The need to organize and have leadership and the training within those groups so that you have a peculiar circumstance where people have left and you're trying to draw them back, which is, is even more challenging when you don't have the infrastructure, et cetera. Um, and another particular challenge 
uh, it faces indigenous uh, groups. Um, and what, uh, for Yuman, what should be taken into consideration when talking about the particular opportunities for indigenous groups uh, in your country and elsewhere? Yes, um, yeah, thank you. Uh, so uh, when we talk about indigenous peoples, um, uh, we, we start to uh, think about how important uh, the role of indigenous peoples and their tra traditional knowledge uh, uh, for the society. Uh, so uh, when we uh, globally, uh, indigenous peoples form like 370 million, which is like 5% of the world's population. However, when we look at the poorest population, then we form 15%. So then we can see how poor and uh, yeah, at first this, uh, the situation with indigenous peoples is. Uh, but however, when we uh, talk about invest thing in uh, rural youth, uh, indigenous youth, uh, what we need to consider is uh, access to the land, their territory and our territory and natural resources. Uh, because indigenous peoples are the ones who have been practicing uh, for um, like ages, for ages, and collective ownership and collective management of the, the resources that we have. But the challenges uh, that we are facing uh, in many indigenous communities is lack of recognition and as indigenous peoples and lack of recognition of these collective rights and, uh, collective rights and access to our own uh, territories and land. So uh, this is the first thing, uh, the laws and policy that uh, recognize uh, the indigenous people's ownership to our lands and territories. And uh, the other one is the education system that we have been having in different countries. Uh, because indigenous peoples, are, uh, indigenous peoples have our own distinctive cultures, which are different from mainstream society, our own languages, and our own ways of uh, development. So when we talk about development and when we talk about sustainable development, it should be uh, the development for indigenous peoples by indigenous peoples. So uh, it is really important that uh, Whenever we talk about this, even for agricultural development, for indigenous youth, uh, it should be, uh, there should be the full uh, practice of free, prior, and informed consent, not only for the development projects or the programs of governments or development agencies, but also in the process of designing and programming uh, these um, uh, development, agricultural development programs, it is really important to consult and uh, with the full uh, free parent informed consent process, yes. So Sebastian had mentioned organizing to help train each other, but you're also saying to organize uh, in order to advocate yes. uh, and to make sure the policies uh, within the government are appropriate both for youth and for indigenous peoples in general. Right? Yes. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll go to each of the, the remaining two panelists, but then just to note that I will ask questions. Uh, we'll, we'll turn to the audience to see what questions you have, so you can start thinking of your questions now. Uh, before that, let me go back to Dominic. Um, as I mentioned before, the rural, rural youth employment was part of the Germany's G20 presidencies. Um, are these responses aligned with the discussions and results of that initiative? So you've, you've heard yes. our, our visitors here. Um, are the, do they match with, uh, with what, was, what came out of the G20 and what, what you think uh, the initiatives going forward are for, for the actions that Germany is following up on? Yes, yes, um, I'm, I'm absolutely happy because what I just heard confirms that um, when we created what we call our Marshall Plan with Africa um, before we took G20 presidency is absolutely uh, well designed. Um, Marshall Plan with Africa first not for Africa, we are not deciding on behalf of our African partners what's good for them. Um, you, could, you could do the same thing with Asia or with uh, South America, it's valid for each and every country. Um, we, we have to listen to the people and, and to listen to their solutions and then um, consider how we can support them in implementing these solutions. Secondly, Marshall Plan, because with um, the SDG agenda, we cannot continue with programs and projects a bit here, a bit there. We need a holistic approach. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the analogy with the American Marshall Plan will not carry very far, mm -hmm. but this is what's behind it. And then um, in G20, we tried to pick out a few of the most important elements because Germany, being a large donor, but still, we, we can't 
get very far if we do it alone. So for the agricultural sector, we tried to put something together for rural youth in Africa. Um, we managed the G20 to uh, agree that together and jointly we'll try to bring 5 million people into vocational educational training and create at least 1.1 million additional jobs. It's a drop of cold water on a hot stone, but still it's something. And this morning, I don't remember who it was, but somebody saying the hey praise um, of subsistence, subsistence farming. I can't agree to that. And if I listen to you, um, subsistence farming is mostly um, a synonym to um, a, a whole life in poverty. And that's not what young people are aspiring to. You, you all confirmed that. Um, therefore, vocational education training is extremely important because that is how you can grow a business, how you can make a business out of it. And if, if we start from the grassroots level, we can also avoid what we are seeing in the cocoa industry, in the cotton industry, in, in the garment industry, that this is to the detriment. Um, um, if, if you have the international, the large international investors, often it's to the detriment of the social and ecological sustainability of the production. And although people are better integrated in global value chains, they still don't benefit, they still don't have acceptable living conditions. So therefore, I think we, we need not just to talk to our industry and to our consumers for behaving more responsibly. We also need to support people like you trying to create something like this and, and, and really starting from the grassroots level to build futures for themselves. Thank you. Uh, a, a global perspective and now a, a national perspective from Victor. Um, listening to what uh, our panelists have said, your fellow panelists, um, is this the type of thing that you're doing in the program? So you're addressing uh, those kind of concerns uh, with finance, training, advocacy. So what do you think? Yeah, exactly what, uh, what, uh, what was mentioned, that in a country, in any country, first of all, it should, the country should have a regulatory norms and documents which create conditions for economical, social, and structural development of youth organizations in the country. That's we did. But through the projects, and I'll give you a couple of samples um, to explain how we are dealing with and how we support the initiative of youth in, in our country. We, uh, the government of Moldova, set a national program for youth development. We have a separate minister, Minister of uh, Youth and Sport, which cover, I mean, it is responsible in the country for the world. But the other ministries as well, they have their own program. So the National Program for Youth Development is a program which support youth to develop a business uh, to keep them active. Through the program, from, through, through two uh, IFAD projects which were financed uh, with uh, support of uh, Danish government through the NIDA, we financed over 900 youth entrepreneurs who developed their own business. And I will tell you that 42% uh, of these youth entrepreneurs are ladies, are, are women. This is very important. And considering that uh, this, the 95% the of the, those youth entrepreneurs which we financed are micro businesses, which means are exactly that target group which is, needs more of this assistance. And definitely the, the program, the last project will end in June this year. But what is encouraging that the other state agency picked up our experience and they will continue this program. There is another agency, state agency for payments, which will continue financing and supporting youth entrepreneurs in the country. With training, we quite invested a lot and will continue to do that, uh, supporting youth in, in training them. In, when we train them, we involved uh, quite largely experience of leaders of the industry, lead, uh, farmers who are leading in the country to bring experience to the youth and teaching them how to do that and giving them, inviting to their companies to show how the business is developing. I will, one thing which I want to mention, in the country we have quite a lot of uh, youth organizations which are of the help as well for the project as, as as well for the, for the youth themselves. We have National Council of Youth in the country, which is a platform which represents 58 association of youth from the country, regional youth associations. That's quite a lot. There is National Association of um, Youth Entrepreneurs. 
Then uh, uh, there is uh, uh, another association. In, in Farm Federation has association of young farmers. And this is not just as mentioned on the paper. These are active organization which are uh, discussing with the government, which are lobbying the uh, interest in, in, into the government. Okay. That's okay. a... Okay, thank you very much. So it sounds like a lot of what you're doing is addressing some of the, the concerns, the needs of the, of the youth, not just in Moldova, but could potentially be used elsewhere. Um, so now we'll uh, see if there's any questions from the audience. Um, again, if you can raise your flag and uh, someone with a microphone can come, come around. Are there any questions? Uh, Denmark? Thank you to the panel and to our young people here who have been very, very articulate and, and good to listen to. Um, as you have heard from our colleague in Moldova, Denmark has a strong priority on youth and putting young people into our development work. And um, one of the other things that we're doing that maybe could be an inspiration is that we have employed youth ambassadors, young people, to be part of the decision-making process and to developing our programs and in, integrate it in our ministry. And, and it might be something we could think about in the future. Okay. So and I, the idea of youth ambassadors. Um, any other questions, comments? Uh, France? Merci beaucoup. Et Thank you very much indeed for a highly interesting debate and uh, it's delightful to see young people yes all too often we talk about young people and giving them priority but in their absence so well done hats off to you for that obviously we're very happy um, that IFAD has given such a priority to youth issues as a cross-cutting issue uh, and also as a priority theme within the uh, strategic plan. We fully support the German initiative on the G20 on youth as well. Three points, if I may. One on youth participation. The uh, Moldovan example was very good. How can we involve young people in decision-taking too? Because I think that in all of our countries, we have to listen to their needs if we're going to be able to to uh, um, respond to those priorities. We've talked a lot about education and training. Obviously, that's crucial. But you also raised the point of uh, really um, making the most of the uh, agricultural professions, flagging them. How can we do more of this? How do we go about this debate, which exists in all of our countries, in France, for example, where we, it's difficult for us to encourage young people to stay in agricultural professions. So I think we have to raise that awareness and uh, uh, really try and uh, highlight these professions, make the most of them. And there's also the question of the agricultural model we wish to promote, because a lot of these, the models out there basically um, over many years, in our country, for example, um, we've seen a drop in the rural population, so there's been a, a drain uh, on jobs. So we have to bring some thought to more sustainable methods of production. In other words, have an environmental dimension, a social dimension, and of course an economic uh, dimension in their health aspects as well. So we have to bring thought to this, which will have jobs, employment at the focus of the development model. And we're also going to have to look at family agriculture, um, ecological type um, agriculture, also uh, about agricultural policy. It's very important to think of all of these things. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, before I go to the next one, let me, uh, let me see if uh, one of you could respond. We have a couple of questions. Um, the first is how to involve young people. Uh, do any of you want to give some specific, uh, Sebastian, do you want to go ahead and uh, mm. how do we involve them in the decision making process and making sure we're getting their feedback? Well, 
it's very similar to what we're doing right now in Colombia. We are involving uh, young people uh, through the network in uh, uh, helping shape the public policies for rural areas. But how can we get young people interested uh, in uh, political issues? We've got a lot of cases in uh, Colombia, not only in rural, also in urban areas, where uh, young people hear this term political and all they can think about is corruption. Politics, I don't want to get involved in that. I, I'm not attracted to it. It's, it's, there's too much corruption there. So what can we do to make sure that young people actually change um, that? We've done um, capacity building, basically, and uh, we've uh, um, seen various different projects being uh, rolled out in different areas. And it's young people, young people themselves, who have uh, dealt with uh, capacity building in rural areas. So when young people see other people young people involved in them, it makes it uh, more attractive and the, the information gets across better. So it's important to have these awareness building, um, capacity building networks as well, work through institutions. And what we need is trust. Not all institutions trust young people, either rural or urban. And so we need to place some trust in young people. In Colombia, We've seen that when uh, institutions wanted to design programs for rural youth, they said, well, uh, they'd shape them and then try and implement them, roll them out, and it didn't work. So I think that if an institution, IFAD, for example, wants a program on uh, rural youth, they have to listen to those young people, what they really want to make sure that when it's rolled out, then it's actually going to work. So trust is crucial. And uh, uh, through... Um, enabling young people as well. It, it, it's important, you know, if the trust is there, the young people will step in. And this is what we've done in Colombia. We've got lots of uh, uh, groups. We've got one which is financed by IFAD, where uh, we've brought young people together, they've raised their needs, and we put those to the various institutions and the government. We said, OK, um, you've conducted your own diagnosis. This is the reality for young people in rural areas. We want to work on what we really need, and we want to work with institutions such as IFAD to move all of this forward. So basically, what it boils down to is that word cr trust, I would say. I'll ask a separate question, uh, somewhat interpreting what France is saying. Uh, we'd already answered this to a degree, so I'm going to ask you, Mon, how do you get uh, people to stay in rural areas? How do you get them? What uh, in a lot of countries, people are, are, even in developed countries, people are still leaving. How do you get agriculture to be appealing, to stay in rural areas to be appealing? So what are your views? Uh, yes, uh, actually this is uh, really important to keep uh, young people in rural areas. I mean, uh, because now that it has become very much problematic for even for, yeah, we have member states here, and you know, all the problems with uh, dealing with these metropolitan cities and um, really big cities where the, uh, all the transportation and all the services, it's really, really become challenging. So uh, the most important thing is the gap the development gap and opportunity gap that exists uh, in cities and in rural areas. Uh, the reason, the main reason why rural uh, youth uh, move, leave out of uh, these rural areas is uh, because there is no incentive and there is no opportunity. So th when it comes to uh, this agriculture development, uh, yeah, my friends have also discussed a lot. Uh, there can be many incentives, and uh, also there can be special programs for youths. And uh, the, the, um, the main challenge for youths uh, to set up our own uh, agriculture, uh, for example, even for me, when I finished uh, my university degree, and I really wanted to go back and do farming in my, farmer's, uh, in my father's farm, but he didn't allow me. He just told me, go to the city, continue your studies, and try to get a better job there. So I, I don't blame my father because there, there, is no, there was no uh, incentive for uh, young people. So uh, the way would be one to uh, establish like a fund for the, 
find access for uh, youths who would like to start up their agriculture business or uh, these agricultural activities. And uh, the other one is that uh, to make them feel uh, accepted and welcome, their ideas are welcome in their own areas and local areas. And for indigenous youths, um, uh, we have uh, this traditional knowledge uh, that we are trying to transfer from our older generation. So it is also very important to acknowledge um, the, that these technologies uh, are really helpful and these technologies um, uh, are very much problem solving for the existing, uh, including this climate change. So. Uh, yeah, I think this acceptance and acknowledgement yeah. is really important. Yeah, your, your story is interesting. When we, I went with the executive board of IFAD to Bangladesh, and one of the questions the board members kept asking of the, the parents, not the kids, is what do you want your children to do? And no one ever said to be a farmer. They all wanted them to work for the government because that was a nice secure job or to, to maybe go in business but never to be a farmer. So it is, uh, it's a concern when the parents themselves are telling uh, kids that those aren't the, that isn't the place to go. Um, trying to get at the third comment on, on France, which is a little more complicated, right? Um, the way that the decisions we make right now on agriculture will determine uh, how, what agriculture looks, particularly in your countries, how, what agriculture looks like in 20, 30 years. Um, so how, how do you think, uh, uh, Rita, for, for you, for Kenya, um, what types of things do you think you need to do uh, as young people in agriculture to make sure that agriculture is sustained, sustainable, that it can be, there's a future there, that uh, we don't destroy the underlying basis of agriculture? So your thoughts? Um, I think one of the uh, things that may, may have already mentioned is the fact that for us to keep the youth, um, then we really need to move from um, agriculture just as a way of life or subsistence farming and how do we make agriculture profitable so that um, in the next generation or we, with the youth, when we get children, we'll be telling them you can actually get into agriculture. So it's really, we need to start making agriculture, uh, in a sense, profitable, but of course, at the same time, making sure we're looking at um, environmental sustainability um, in doing that. Uh, but for me, that's one of the key things. And we have to um, keep highlighting not only the professions, but even the um, uh, agricultural or agribusinesses that are really being led by the youth and are succeeding so that um, we really get inspired, you really get inspired when you see your peer doing really well and um, uh, in, in an area that m many people would shy away from. So we need to keep hearing and seeing uh, some of the success stories out there to change that narrative moving forward. Okay, thanks. Uh, there's a question I believe from Vanuatu. Thank you, you moderator. Um, let me thank the uh, the panelists, I think um, it's high time for, for the youth to be also part of our discussions as policy makers. Uh, just one or two points. It's with respect to the point raised by uh, Director General um, Dominique Zilla um, with respect to the TV, uh, Tibet. Um, it's important to have all these trainings and um, I just wanted to pick up from some of the panelists whether your views on when um, all these agencies send the experts to our countries or local communities, whether it is important for them to interact with uh, students or um, youth in all these centers. Uh, that's an important um, element that I can have your views on that. The second point is with respect to incentives. And one of the issues that I wanted to um, know from your side, what are the challenges that you would face when they have to uh, request for financial assistance? Thank you. Hey, uh, so, Dominic, if you don't mind uh, taking that. Uh, so, in the, you, you talked about general plans uh, for the G20 and a number of actions going forward. Do, do you make a conscious effort in doing this, or could you make a conscious effort in the future? Uh, in doing this to, to engage in the youth and the discussions that you're having and in the decisions that you're, you're actually making? 
Well, um, the good thing is um, G20 has an accountability mechanism. Okay. So we regularly check up on, did we live up to our promises? So these promises will be followed by concrete action. And certainly, if I look back to the things I, I, I said in my first intervention, yes, we, we need to start at the local level, at the grassroots level, and we need to develop blueprints, but then we can't do it project-wise all over the world. This, this, this does not work. We, we would never see the end of it. So we need to bring these blueprints to the national level so that they can be copied in other parts of that same country or in other countries in similar situations. And one lesson learned uh, over many years of development cooperation certainly is talk to the people first. Don't, don't think that you can solve their problems because you will solve putative problems and not the real problems. And listen to the people what they need. And, and secondly, I think, and, and, and that's also very, very important, don't think that there are silver bullets or one size fits all. This does not exist. Um, you, you will have to develop these blueprints very carefully and to do it in a way that they can be adapted to the concrete situation in differing contexts. Otherwise, you will, you will uh, definitely fail. I remember that in former times, before we, we had the fusion, the merger to GIZ, the, the three predecessor organizations were very different. Some were at the grassroots level, others were more at the policy level um, um, in the ministries of the partner countries. Now we have it all in one organization. That's much better because you can, you can better interlink it. And therefore, I think this, this merger also was a smart move. So we try to also improve our um, internal organization from day to day. Hey, thanks. And, uh, Victor, why not, I'll ask you the same question. Uh, in the programs that you're designing that you've already described, uh, have you engaged young people in, in the design of them, trying to figure out what the best approach? Is this something you're systematically doing? Yes. Uh, really, to have a successful uh, implementation or good impact, you need to involve from the very beginning the beneficiaries to see, to find out, first of all, what they need and where are the the most sensitive points where we could intervene or interact with uh, or solving that. Just during the design of the missions and we, when we start to design, already we have meetings and we are visiting young entrepreneurs asking what are the constraining accessing finance, do they have collateral to, uh, to put in a bank to have an investment or something else. And based on this, we are designing uh, responses and exactly measures to respond and to help uh, them. And really, it's, as more we involve the, them, the youth entrepreneurs in, in, in preparation of the decision-making documents or projects or whatever, it's much better and much more successful on this. Yep. And you. in continuation with the, the message which you presented and some uh, uh, of the panelists regarding that parents normally they say, don't go in agriculture as I did in my village. They look from their perspective because they, they, way, they have an impression they will continue weeding by hand in the field, which is absolutely different. Now we have young entrepreneurs which are farming and they are coming with initiative. You'll see which harvesters or tractors more than they are using. They are quite different farmers than our parents or grandparents. That's why we, they have a, uh, they, don't see exactly in the way like youth entrepreneurs are see the business in agriculture, really business as you mentioned, that is very correct. In agriculture, we should to look not just agriculture to punish someone, but say agriculture, it's a business and needs to be developed as business. Very good. Uh, I think we have another question from the Netherlands. Thank you very much. And Luckily, at the end, almost at the end of our governing council, we hear the voice of the youth. I have a very concrete question to the three youth rep representatives. If you were the president of IFAD, <laughs> which... Someday. <laughs> no, now, now, not now, because then it's not, because the specific question is, if you were now the president of IFAD, which two decisions for change and action would you take? A good, challenging question. Any, any volunteer to answer? Sebastian, please. 
Una pregunta muy interesante. Interesting question, yes. First and foremost, well, I think basically uh, um, we've got to put the focus on young people in the council and, the, and decision taking. It's very important. As I say, uh, IFAD has made a gesture and it's given this uh, priority to involving young people. But we need to actually take a step further and get people involved, young people involved in decision taking in, in fora such as this one, the Governing Council. And then I think we need to ensure that technology can um, facilitate access, make uh, agriculture easier, more straightforward. But in Colombia, one of the challenges um, I was explaining beforehand is access to land. A lot of young people want to be farmers, but they, they have to change. So we have to understand that in order to uh, trigger rural development, uh, it's not just about agriculture. There are a lot of young people in rural areas who are uh, involved in other projects, culture, sports, um, the environment. All of these issues create um, income and rural development. So I would invest in that as well, not only in agricultural-related projects. OK, that's the most important one. But I think we also need to look at other types of projects which can generate rural development and will involve young people. We've seen an awful lot of that in Colombia right now. Uh, you know, there's various initiatives uh, being rolled out there, but more than 25% of them were not related to agriculture. They were on culture, the environment, and they also uh, created uh, income and resources and, and brought about changes in uh, young people's lives. So, yes, that is uh, something that I would adopt as a measure if I were president. Anything? Uh, um, you don't have to. But <laughs> I, I think what I would add uh, is um, if I were the president, then I'd really make sure that would um, really question whatever project is being taken up. Is is it really going down to to help the, the the youth farmers? Because sometimes with some of the protocols or the procedures um, that goes through uh, the government and before the benefits reach um, reach down to the farmer, I mean, it's we are wrapping up the project. So it really is to look at how these projects are being designed. Um, is the farmer ultimately benefiting? I think uh, one of the delegates earlier today was talking about some of uh, these uh, rural farmers requiring um, credit of even less than $1,000, but they never get to access that. Um, yet a lot of investments are being made from the top. So how um, I, I would make sure any project that is being um, implemented, it is super clear how that is going to immediately benefit the farmer um, down there at the farm level or at the rural level. Very good. You yes. uh, Actually, I would like to give more than two, but we are <laughs> limited to two. So uh, in order to choose the most uh, important two uh, suggestions, are, uh, the decisions I would take is the first one is loan for young farmers uh, program. Uh, so that, that would be uh, uh, particularly for young, uh, young uh, farmers. And uh, the other uh, would be um, internship program for the youths uh, uh, within the IFAD. Uh, because we, uh, it is really important for uh, the young people to understand how these agencies and how these uh, fundings work and how these different mechanisms work uh, so that we can have uh, good access and then we can also have, well, we can learn how to uh, make a good influence on uh, the decision making of the whole process. And uh, just one thing, when we set up this uh, loan for young farmers, it would be um, as least bureaucratic as possible. <laughs> because we young uh, people, uh, when we work at the grassroots level, the most, uh, uh, the biggest challenge for us is uh, in uh, getting access to fundings or loans is that they always require very high financial or managerial, um, all these different procedures and mechanisms, which is really 
uh, like a big burden for those people who are really working at the grassroots. So uh, I would make it as uh, least uh, bureaucratic as possible when it comes to uh, the funding for young people. Yes, thank you. Okay, yeah. So uh, just D Dominic also wants to be president of VFAD, so he's going to make uh, <laughs> make one comment about about this, and then we're going to switch gears a little and start talking about migration and have a video. But I'm first, go ahead. So grateful that you're working on my career. Um, <laughs> no, uh, I, I, the question wasn't addressed to me, but I still I would like to bring in two examples of how it's done elsewhere. Um, at the G20, we have the engagement groups. Women 20, Business 20, Civil Society 20, and also the Youth 20. Mm -hmm. And these engagement groups give input to all the work streams of G20. We are listening to them. What's their point of view on the topics we are dealing with? Uh, and even the Chancellor has invited representatives of all the engagement groups and listened to them. So um, if we have um, uh, an institution here which has youth as a cross-cutting issue, I think we need something like that. And secondly, if you look at the United Nations High-Level Political Forum, they have youth ambassadors. And each time in New York, when we have the uh, um, HLPF, there are a few youth representatives who are encouraged to take the floor to give their perspective. We could also think about that. Do it here. Why not? Yeah, that, that's also, um, I mean, we, none of us probably is, is living in these rural communities. Um, we have not always the best, we're, we're not very well interconnected with reality. We also need reality checks, be it by young people, be it by others. Um, and, and therefore I think um, these interactive sessions, this is much better than having old people reading out statements to each other <laughs> which were pre prefabricated by some people in our administrations. Yeah, I'm, I'm really grateful to be on such a panel. <laughs> Thanks. So as I said, we're going to shift gears a bit. We're going to start talking about migration, and we'll start with a, a video. Kate Sambediane is a successful Senegalese farmer. He is the leader of his farmers association. He's a member of local government. But a few years ago, he was a migrant in Italy, struggling to find work to support his family. You cannot have a bank account. You cannot have work. There are many things you cannot have. You, you don't understand the language. There are a great variety of problems at all levels. But you have to face these problems because your family has expectations. They think that because you're there, you can do anything financially. They ask for money for any occasion. Because you're there, they think you have money, and this is often not the case. We leave to have a better life, but it's not easy, it's not obvious, and it's time to tell the truth. After five years in Italy, he heard that an IFAD financed project called PAFA had started in his village back home giving young farmers technical and financial support to build their businesses. So Pape returned home. With support from the project, he started cultivating rice and raising livestock. He now has a house of his own and has more money in his pocket than he did as a migrant. There is nothing better than living in your place, seeing your family and educating your children as you want to. I think we have nothing to envy from those who are migrating to Europe. I advise young people to stay, because the idea that they have of migration, like the one I had myself before leaving, does not correspond to reality. Here there is land, it rains, we are young, we can develop activities and have a successful life. If you go to Europe, it is not certain that you will be successful. You can fail as well. Out of 100 people, maybe only 10 or even less are successful. So I recommend young people to stay here and work on activities that allow them to make a decent living and support their families. Okay, thank you. Uh, so as the video shows, the, the return opportunities for migrants and going back, and migration, it's hard to talk about rural youth and not talk about the migration issue. So we'll, we'll start with, uh, with Victor as a representative of the government. How can governments support balanced migration and mobility processes uh, from rural to urban areas? So how do, what can you do to, so that people have opportunities in both places? And I think it was mentioned earlier, avoid the opportunity gap. Well, to reduce migration, it's not role only of the government. That's we need to recognize because 
the effort should be put from all uh, other players in the society. It can be business, private business, that can be financial institutions, but we need to recognize that the key role in that is the government. The government is the, the institution which creates conditions for the others to influence, to stop the migration. Uh, and probably there is no uh, general recommendation for all countries. First, it's necessary to see what are the factors which stimulate the migration. In some cases, this is con these are conflicts. In other cases, a uh, lower level of life and so on. And based on this already, it needs to be to, to develop. But what I see in that part of the world, the, the government can be efficient if they uh, will implement a couple of things which are needed. First, the only government can uh, afford to invest in developing infrastructure to improve the life level in the villages and the communities. These are water supply lines, gas supply lines, road infrastructure, any others. I'll give you a, a very simple Example, last week I visited one of our youth entrepreneurs which developed a business in a village. He graduated Medicine University and applied for a loan uh, to invest in a clinic. He is a dentist. And he opened in his village where he was born a clinic which is certified, is licensed, and he started the business in the village. When we visited him, there were people staying there and we asked questions, how do you find in your village to have a clinic like that. And, and people were so happy with that, saying that now we don't need to travel somewhere uh, and to cure to the doctor to, to meet me. Now it's in the village. I can easily go there. This is, these are services which needs to be developed in, in the community, in the rural area. And when we talk about the use, it does not mean that we'll keep all of them farming. No, that's not correct we need to develop the rural uh, services in, in the villages. Secondly, um, there is a new, uh, we always in the, we have indicators, job creation as a number. We need to think about not just number of jobs, number of jobs well paid, mm -hmm. motivated. People, if they are motivated, they will stay in the place where he, they were born, where they, like the, the nature and the, the neighbors and so on and then. A new tendency which appear uh, in our part, of, in our region there, it is a flow of the, or I would say an interest from the industry to invest in, in agriculture. There are several businesses which are developed in rural areas, say in construction, building, so on, and they have liquidity, they have funds, and they are already looking for investments in an agriculture or in rural area. Here is the role of the government to create good, attractive conditions for those to redirect the flow of money from, uh, from urban um, businesses to, to rural. Okay. As well, uh, uh, quite of interest it is uh, that the government should uh, create conditions for foreign investment, to attract in investments from abroad. Okay. Specifically for the countries like uh, we talked. Yeah. So, so uh, Rita, you heard what Victor said, the, the types of description he's giving in possible government policies. So how can we get people either not to leave or if they do leave, uh, get educated, et cetera, come back? Uh, so what are the types of things that, might, that you think might be done in, in Kenya? Um, uh, I think top on the list would be to tell more stories of um, what, what, what we've just seen because um, when a fellow youth uh, tells you that um, th they've been, they've, they've migrated to the urban areas um, and they came back and they're doing much better um, uh, now that they're in their rural areas, it really changes the narrative. So number one is just to, let's talk more about some of those success stories. Let's um, hear more about, not just in agriculture, but um, even as uh, Victor has spoken about a, a clinical person or a pharmacist who's gone and studied uh, pharmacy and is not looking for opportunities in, in the city, but really coming back to uh, build their, um, 
set up something in the rural area. So let's keep talking about and exposing some of these uh, uh, success stories um, and we'll see more youths um, staying and actually coming back. Um, another thing that um, 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 just going back to like the training and the education system and even using Kenya as an example, I think uh, some years back, um, studying agriculture all the way from primary school was, was, was something key. But as the, the education system has evolved over time, we're no longer taught agriculture in school. So the focus is shifting more to um, uh, sort of blue collar ki kind of training. So how, how do we get uh, the children interested in um, um, some of these agricultural uh, activities from there? Uh, I mean, you even go to, um, at university level, um, most of the children or, or uh, most students really no longer aspire to go to uh, technical universities that will give them some of the skills that they can directly apply in rural areas. They all want to go to study business um, and, and, and other courses. So how do we bring that back in our education system um, and not push the students away from um, agriculture and some of these uh, skills that they can apply in the rural areas. So as uh, uh, part of the G20, Dominic, they, there was some study on rural employment opportunities. Um, can you give us a sense of what some of the, the conclusions you came to uh, out of those, out of that background? I, I, would, I would rather um, uh, share one or two other thoughts with you, <laughs> which just came to my mind listening to the discussion. I mean, it, it sounds a bit like a no-brainer. Um, you have at least 90% of the world population very attached to their home country, to their hometown, to their home village, and not really willing to move away. Uh, so most, most of the migration that's happening is happening out of poverty, out of necessity. At the same time, in the industrialized countries, you have not very many countries eager to accommodate lots of immigrants. You've seen that in the refugee crisis. So um, looks like it was obvious that we should enforce our support, especially to those areas from, from where the refugees and the migrants are coming. On the other hand, it's a bit of a slippery slope because if you start having a look at development cooperation just as a means to avoid immigration and to avoid influx of refugees and migrants, um, I think we are totally forgetting um, the solidarity aspect the humanitarian aspect, and the aspect that we have set ourselves with the 2030 agenda, a set of targets that we are all um, supposed to live up to. And if we lose this, um, then in the end, um, I think we'll get poorer. Um, all of us will get, not, not um, um, financially poorer, but uh, morally poorer, and, and this cannot be just uh, the only um, justification for development cooperation. And I think that's also, coming back to your question, one of the lessons learned in our G20 presidency, that yes, this is all interlinked, but um, if we started to just address those countries and areas from which people are threatening uh, to come into our, um, into our countries, we would uh, leave out the others. And we are supposed to leave no one behind. So, the, so uh, we're talking about migration, but as Dominic just said, uh, we, we need to think in terms of opportunities, not just avoiding migration and creating opportunities in rural areas. Um, what can, uh, uh, Sebastian, what can international organizations and uh, bilateral donors, what can they do to help uh, provide those opportunities? How do we give voice to, to young people to ensure that, that they have a say in the opportunities that are generated? Um, I, th I think that this is a very important issue, generating opportunities. In rural areas, there are many institutions that have programs for your rural youth, but there are many hindrances. Sometimes programs don't reach the field because sometimes the organizations that uh, offer those programs do so on websites and as we all know most rural youth have no internet access and not many of them uh, have the right sort of capacity to access such proje projects so it's important to start thinking about the kind of young people who need those opportunities how we can solve their problems that's why we focus on 
organizing young people into associations, into networks, how to bring them together so that they can start thinking of solutions to their problems. We've often realized that solutions to one problem in one place might lie in another place in the same country. So this is all about exchanging experiences so that young people can learn from each other and come together to solve their problems. In Colombia, we want to change that paternalistic mentality. It's important for us to ensure that young people start to generate their own opportunities as key players, for them to understand that they themselves can generate rural development. And just to add, a little to what you're asking about what we should invest in, especially in rural areas. I think that technology is key because it makes work on the field, in the field, much easier. Employment, creating initiatives, support created by institutions such as IFAD so that young people can generate resources. Another important thing is that feeling of ownership that young people should have for their land. And that can be done through training so that they can understand how valuable it is for them to be rural young people, realizing that it's not nothing to be ashamed of and that they should be honored to be a, a rural, rural young people. As one of our colleagues was saying, many of these development models aren't adapted to the rural milieu Often cities are seen as development areas and the farm is seen as something else. So I think we need to do something about that, working on education. For instance, in Colombia, we're part of the Rural Education Roundtable. It's a national roundtable with many different actors where we've been speaking about the importance of a type of education which focuses on the rural areas so that young people start to understand that rural areas also provide employment. Often people ask, people say, well, one day you will need a doctor or a lawyer in case you're sick or in case you need legal services, but you will always need farmers. So young people need to understand that message, and if they get that message, then we will achieve change. The, basically the same question to you, uh, what can the international community do to help young people, but with a particular uh, emphasis on issues that you think indigenous youth might face? Yeah. Um, uh, the, biggest, uh, the biggest challenge for indigenous youth uh, has been uh, the language. Uh, that is uh, the medium of uh, language for teaching. Um, so, the, uh, for example, in Myanmar, uh, the matriculation exam, uh, if we compare with uh, the mainstream society and indigenous societies, uh, the, the rate is really low in compared to the mainstream society, and mainly because we um, teach at schools only with uh, this national language. Uh, however, uh, for many indigenous communities, we speak the national language only after, like, uh, from middle school. So when you, uh, we were receiving basic education, uh, like primary school, uh, we didn't un understand what is being taught at schools. So that has a, great, a really big impact when we go, uh, like, um, how should I say, middle and then higher education. So it has a really big impact on that. So uh, for us, uh, in order for these indigenous youth to really improve, uh, we need a bilingual education system or if possible, multilingual education system. It can be like uh, done in consultation with the relative, uh, the respective uh, indigenous communities. And uh, that language, it also has a uh, really big impact on identity and our culture, because there has been uh, like really big assimilation on language and culture, which makes uh, the indigenous youth feel inferior to uh, the mainstream society. And that uh, consequently uh, hinders us a lot from participating in decision making and uh, to, the, to contribute to the bigger uh, society as a whole. Uh, so. Uh, education, uh, investing in education, and which is inclusive and meaningful participation. 
uh, for all. And that is uh, the, the main thing uh, that uh, we would like all the uh, development agencies also to uh, participate. And uh, UNICEF is doing really good uh, in Myanmar uh, that when it comes to this uh, mother tongue based uh, education system. So we really need to continue this effort. Um, and the other one is uh, more guarantee and support for small scale farmers not uh, really big. Uh, so when we talk about agro-business, uh, what we usually see is like a large scale, uh, and we need more protection and support for small scale farmers. And uh, also the other thing is that I think media has a really big role uh, in this, uh, because we can mainstream this agricultural development for young people. Um, uh, as a fashion, actually, because for uh, many decades, it's been many decades, uh, especially in my country or in Asia, that uh, those people who are working on agriculture are uh, seen more as like those people who are left behind or who are lower, but actually we can portray that as a fashion, and uh, we just really, uh, we can portray as a really high, and as it is, as it is, so we can, uh, yeah, so media also plays uh, a very important role. And then uh, whatever we do, it's, what is really important is we need to go, we need to implement all these from the rights-based approach. So when we talk about development, it should always be rights-based uh, because uh, in order that we do no harm. Um, yeah. Thank you. It's, Thank you. Um, so uh, we're starting to run short on time, but we have time for one or two more questions. Uh, are there any questions on the migration issue or more generally uh, on any issues? Uh, Gabon, uh, the microphone's coming to you. Uh, she, she'll bring the microphone to you. Merci. There you go. Merci. Thank you. I was following the statements made by the panelists keenly. And I welcome the fact that the concerns of young people are the same everywhere, namely, they're worried about the profitability, profitability of agricultural activities, about funding for those activities. They're concerned about land ownership, But I must say that we really want more. We want to see real commitment on the part of governments because there's a history behind this. Our, family, our families were involved in agriculture due to subsistence needs, but that doesn't mean there shouldn't be a commitment to do something. We will train young people who will always be waiting for something, always needing something. And it's a real shame. They need uh, access to the internet to be farmers. They need this and that. So there's always an excuse for them not to commit to being farmers. So I would like for these young people who are here today to understand that it's time to act, that there are too many excuses when it comes to funding, when it comes to modernizing the drudgery of the sector, and it's time for them to commit to working for their countries, for their continent, and for the world as a whole. Thank you. I, I think for these uh, three particular young people, they have committed to act <laughs> and, and are doing exactly what you're describing. What we need to do is make sure we get more doing the exact same. I believe Ecuador uh, has a question. Sí, no, solo para... Thank you. I just wanted to acknowledge just how important it is to see young people taking part, Rita, Sebastian, and May alike. I think it's important that we pick up on what Sebastian said. The alternative in rural development and in the field, and I think I fully agree with Sebastian, doesn't just have to do with sowing or engaging in farming activities. I think that young people can really undertake other types of business enterprises on the ground. There can be different kinds of rural development, developing the market of non-financial services, for instance, 
which have to do with what you said quite clearly, culture, but also other types of important services in terms of linking uh, these activities to the language, to the culture. So it's fundamental to understand what kind of financial markets and non-financial markets we can develop for young people. And I think therein lies the key for us to consolidate the development of young people's enterprises. Thank you. Um, we, if we can have, we're running short on time, so if we can have a brief comment, we'll have Senegal and then Sri Lanka, and then we'll let the, the panelists have a final word. So, Senegal. Okay, okay, thank you. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Mr. Winters. Firstly, I'd like to greet everyone and welcome the video which was aired earlier on my uh, fellow national PAP. And I think that it's really important that we focus on young people going back to farming. And I think that IFAD can play a key role in bringing in more modernity to these activities because young people are increasingly within the framework of the fight against uh, migration and rural development to go back to the field, to go back to their land. However, envisaging that return to the farm by young people using ancestral methods, well, I don't really think that young people in Africa can enthusiastically go back to these activities so long as activities remain such as they are. And that's the reality on the ground. I come from a village. However, it wouldn't immediately occur to me to go back to my town, aside from wanting to go say hello to my grandmother. I wouldn't immediately want to go back there and work on the farm, not because I'm wearing a tie and because I work in the diplomatic world, simply because in those villages, aside from the fact that they still use traditional methods, the fact is everything that cities have to offer isn't really there when you go to villages in the countryside. If you go to the countryside in developed uh, parts of the world, some of that is there. Some things are available in the countryside. You don't necessarily need to go to cities to get those things. So that's the sort of thing that we need to strengthen if we want to keep young people on farms in the countryside. Go with the last intervention. Thank you. I'm from Sri Lanka. Uh, the Sri Lankan government has taken many initiatives to uh, attack youth to start their own enterprises. Uh, recently, government of Sri Lanka has uh, introduced a concessional loan scheme to unemployed youth uh, graduates to uh, commence their businesses in their own places. Uh, but most of those uh, youth are expected uh, white color jobs. So that is an issue. And uh, in addition, it was observed by a survey done, which was done by the University of Colombo that around uh, 1.5 million youth have selected uh, three wheeler driving as their jobs. So they don't like to continue their higher studies or work in the agriculture sector. So my question is, uh, what would be your advice? How we can uh, in attack those uh, youth to uh, farming sector? Okay, thank you. So again, another question about att attracting the youth to the farming sector. Um, since we're short on time, uh, there's an enormous clock down here. We can see that we're short on time, and I'm afraid well, that's what's going to happen when it comes to zero. Uh, so we'll, we'll have our last uh, comments from each of you. Um, we, we started with the question, why invest in rural youth? Um, so very briefly, if we could get uh, your, your summary of, of why we should invest or uh, what you think the key message to come out of this session is that moving forward uh, in general for EFAD, uh, so, so what should we be doing? So uh, why don't we start with uh, at the global level with Dominic, <laughs> then the country level, then with the individuals. Yes. Thanks. 
very quickly, I, I would just like, uh, avec tout mon respect, um, uh, to contradict the colleague from Gabon. Because I think there are, certainly we don't want to create donor dependencies. Definitely not. But there are issues that young entrepreneurs can't tackle. For example, if you want to export your goods, you need to, to get access to the European markets. Therefore, you need to fulfill technical standards. And these are extremely complicated. You need somebody to assist you in fulfilling these standards. You need laboratories around to check your goods on whether they are up to these standards. Or take the non-tariff trade barriers. There's an enormous room for improvement there. And if, if for example, you have agricultural goods for three months uh, at the customs, well, afterwards you can throw them away. You can't export. So there are issues where development cooperation is still needed and where we can't just say, well, people should get more active. They can't solve it. And that's where we try to be and become involved and to be as transformative as possible. Right, so we need to make sure that the context is... Yes. Uh, that's also answering the opportunities. Right. What shall we do? These are the issues we shall tackle. Right. Very good. Um, Victor, please. Well, from the experience we had working with you in the last four or five years, and uh, I definitely advise that IFAD should continue supporting such projects even in other countries, and we are ready to, uh, to support or to give some experience which we have. I'm looking optimistically on that, and I'm proud of the results we got with our uh, youth entrepreneurs. And the uh, recommendation for the, the, for the countries, invest, continue investing in youth. This probably, as I mentioned once, it's one of the best investments the country can do. Invest in youth entrepreneurs, in youth generation. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, I've been told that we have a few extra minutes, so you don't have to restrict yourself too much and ignore that. Uh, so uh, why don't we go to Sebastian next? So what, what, what should we be doing? Where do you think we should be investing? As a colleague was saying, we have to continue to invest in rural youth, that we have to continue placing our trust in young people to make sure that they become involved in the type of programs that you're conducting in the countries. But they also have to be in at the decision-taking level. So very quickly, you know, we have to follow along what we're doing in Colombia as well, um, basically building the uh, um, capacity amongst young people so that they can really um, feed back into their own communities. And um, through these initiatives that you're doing and back up also for these young people so that they don't feel that they're on their own when they're striving for sustainability. Uh, you mind? Uh, yes. Um, uh, yes, uh, my main takeaway here is like uh, when we talk about this development, uh, it should be in a holistic approach, like Sebastian also mentioned, and uh, not just agricultural development. And in order to uh, support agricultural development, uh, we need to also to look back at other services uh, like education, health, and uh, uh, other cultural activities and so on. So uh, one other thing is that um, uh, this holistic approach uh, uh, to development has been applied in indigenous communities for centuries, let's say. Uh, so it's really important to respect, acknowledge, and also apply these uh, traditional knowledges and local knowledges uh, when we talk about this agricultural development. And uh, also, uh, this investing for, uh, in rural youth is, it should be a process, ongoing process. Uh, yes, uh, we have heard uh, many, uh, also many activities uh, led, uh, initiated by IFAD and uh, other institutions on investing in youth. Uh, but this should be an ongoing, and then it should also be uh, like monitored and assessed on how uh, it is going. Uh, yes, and uh, for me to, uh, I would like to encourage member states uh, that uh, your investment uh, your investment in youth uh, will really uh, g uh, bring, uh, bring us, our societies, uh, really big rewards uh, in compared to the investment uh, that you make. So we are here uh, not just to participate, but we, we are here to offer the solutions to our society, and we are here ready to, uh, to help each other. Yes. Okay, Rita? 
Um, just to pick, pick it up from uh, what my colleagues have said is that, um, I mean, the benefits or what um, societies in the world at large would benefit, uh, would get from investing in the youth is, is glaring. There's no question that that's what we should, um, we should be doing. Uh, I think for me, the key message now is we've had a lot of discussions, um, uh, but it's time that we actually action this. Um, it's, it's time we really uh, get our hands dirty and go involve the youth. Um, involve them in the policy making, involve them um, throughout the design of the projects, just go out there and, and, and really take action. Um, and uh, I'm happy that um, IFAD is uh, leading in that. Thanks. Since we have a couple more minutes, I'm going to ask you one, the three of you one more question. So the Dutch representative, uh, he asked you if you're president of IFAD, uh, what would you do, right? So I'm going to ask you at a, at a lower level, if you're the country director, in your country. Our average loan is 30 to $35 million. And so a lot of it, you've talked about the process, right? So our average loan is 30 to $35 million. So I'm giving you the responsibility to spend 30 to $35 million within your country. Uh, how would you spend it? How, where would you use that money so, uh, to, to invest in such a way that we would include youth in our projects? So uh, I'll, I'll start again going this way, so Sebastian. I think I would continue doing what we're doing in Colombia and work on organizing young people at local level, building their capacity at local level, because uh, I've seen that it's an investment process in their own initiative, basically, and uh, there's a development in these areas then. Basically, we, we have to create the space for young people to be able to talk with institutions. That's very important because so that institutions really do listen to young people who can let their voice heard in the shaping of the projects which affect where they live. Allowing them to have a voice by being organized. So, Yuman, how do you spend your 30 million? <laughs> yes, uh, I would like to add on to what uh, Sebastian has mentioned. I totally agree with these trainings, all these things. And the other one would be uh, to create a word for uh, innovative projects, agricultural projects uh, led by youths. So th that would be not just designed and implemented by them, but jointly with IFAD. Because, um, and also uh, like, um, Technicians, agriculture technicians. So we have like uh, University of Agriculture and we have local schools of agriculture. So we can jointly, uh, yes, as a director, country director of IFAD, I would encourage uh, them to, jo uh, to jointly design the projects and to have many uh, awards and pilots uh, in different uh, local communities. Uh, so that we can come up with really good model, and yes, yeah, and that can also be innovative for many other youths. Very good idea. Create incentives for people to come up with these innovative ideas. Uh, Rita? Um, I think the first thing as a country manager, I would uh, 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 acknowledge that $35 million may sound like a lot of money, but this is very little to um, enable um, the transformation that we need. So I think number one would be to look for uh, partnerships that can help tackle the, di uh, as the panel has already discussed, the issues are not just being involved in agriculture, there is infrastructure that needs to be built, there is so much that needs to happen all at the same time. So I would be very keen on uh, not only bringing in the youth perspective, but being uh, looking at the kind of partnerships that will be the most beneficial. Um, and I'm really, I'm really an advocate of uh, partnerships that work even from the agricultural perspective. When you think about how do you make agriculture work, um, it's the, there are a lot of different pieces. Uh, farmers need access to information, they need access to seeds, they need access to markets, they need finance. So there's really need for uh, partnerships that work for us to um, tackle some of these really complex issues. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, with that, we'll end uh, the panel. Um, let's uh, thank the panel members for their contributions. Uh,
as, as we noted at the beginning, you know, EFAT has to mainstream youth. There will be mainstreaming youth in our EFAT 11 replenishment. And I think this was a very helpful uh, discussion. It already got me thinking about new things that I hadn't thought about before uh, and new ideas. So we greatly appreciate uh, your participation. Thank you.